now it's my pleasure uh, to move over to David Miller. And as uh, Deb was talking about the importance of kids, uh, for many of us in the adult world, it took us a while to realize uh, that kids just weren't little adults. Uh, but I think that we're getting that reinforced over and over again these days. And uh, David Miller is one of those reinforcers. I'm very proud to say that David uh, is a key, uh, an individual who is key to the success of Nashville. Uh, he's been around for many years, uh, 16, what is it, 14 years or 16 years uh, at Nashville. And before that, he had almost an equivalent amount in state government. He has some really good stories of when he was in Texas um, uh, during the good old days. And uh, I, I'm very proud to introduce David Miller. He is somebody who continues to do great work at Nashville. So uh, David, uh, please go ahead. Brian, thank you so much. And I am so excited to moderate this, this session. Um, I think we've already heard this topic come up multiple times already on our first day. And thus we know how critical it is. Uh, we're gonna be focusing on the effects of COVID-19 on children, families, children, youth and families. Um, in the paper that Dr. Ken Rogers authored with um, a couple of his South Carolina colleagues, Louise Johnson and Jayla O'Neill. Um, and I will tell you, as someone who gets to work with the Children's Youth and Family Division of Nashville, that this has probably been the biggest priority for that division, you know, since February of 2020. Um, and really trying to wrap their hands around how, how to do a better job of giving families and children the supports they need to uh, get through the trauma, uh, deal with the trauma. Uh, that COVID-19 has placed on all of us. Um, also very happy and honored, uh, in addition to Dr. Rogers, uh, to have Kana Nomoto and her incredible daughter, uh, Raina Chang, join us today uh, with their story. Um, so I'm gonna do just a brief introduction. Let's get into the, to the meat of it because I feel like this, this is a session that we definitely want some Q&A and dialogue. Um, most of you probably know Kana, uh, when she, because she was SAMHSA administrator for many years uh, and worked at SAMHSA for a long time. And she has a, uh, 20 years of experience in federal executive management and mental health and substance use. Um, she has a experience in data and program and practice improvement. And we saw a lot of that with, with our partnership with her when she was at SAMHSA. Um, currently, she's now a consultant at McKinsey and Company and she co-directs the Center for Societal Benefit Through Healthcare. Um, and we're also very excited to have her daughter with us today. Welcome, Raina. I uh, hope this, 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 that you see a lot of smiling faces during the next 45 minutes. Um, Dr. Ken Rogers uh, is certainly the uh, Director Commissioner for the South uh, Carolina Department of Mental Health. Um, Dr. Rogers received his medical degree from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. He's a board certified, uh, he's board certified in both general psychiatry and in children's psychiatry. Um, very unique, I think, uh, in our field. Um, uh, he also holds a master's degree. She has, holds a master's degree in public health from UCLA and a master's degree in medical management from USC. Uh, so we have an incredible panel and we're very honored for the three of you to join us today to talk about this incredible topic critical topic, and I will hand it over to Kana and Raina. Hi, um, my name is Raina Chang. I'm 17 years old, and today was the first day of my senior year. Um, 18 months ago, if you had asked me if I would live to see this day, my answer would have been a confident no. Even before March 2020, I was struggling to find purpose, meaning, and hope in my life. Um, I possess little optimism for what the future would bring. I can tough it out. It's fine not to feel. These thoughts reverberated through my skull every day and I was in pain, but I thought I had it under control. Then as the year progressed, smiling every day felt like a task. Getting out of bed was nearly impossible. Eating was an occasional thing and the fight appeared more and more unwinnable. Gone was a girl who once was so gleeful it was contagious with a laugh that filled the entire lunchroom. Eventually, I found myself in a very dark place where nothing but self-judgment kept me company. 
And then COVID hit, cementing my emotional isolation into a physical one. A few months later, I lay on a cold wooden floor of my bedroom, neighboring an empty pill bottle, drowning myself in thoughts, waiting for someone to rescue me and tell me that everything was going to be okay because they cared about me, because I meant something to them. I felt lost, forgotten, worthless, and broken. And honestly, I felt like nobody really noticed. While this is my story, I know now that I was not alone. Many of my friends actually struggled through quarantine and online school and the loss of sports, parties, school tradition, and routine. Some people think that given how much my generation uses social media, that the transition to online school should have been easy. I'm here today to tell you that it actually wasn't. Yes, we are teenagers living in an age of social media. We are inherently social, and yes, it's practically impossible to separate us from our phones. But contrary to popular belief, these things combine to make in-person communication even more special. We can talk to anybody online, but it's more comforting to talking in person. Being told we're, we were not allowed to gather, to talk, or to laugh, to be a source of comfort to one another during the first global pandemic in 100 years, it was scary. During COVID-19, I went to treatment, a virtual partial hospitalization program. For 17 weeks, I spent the better part of most of my days online, boring my innermost thoughts to people I've never met in person. Despite the imper impersonal format, I worked my butt off and, ma and made marketed improvements to my mental health. 18 months ago, I couldn't see myself worthy of being happy or proud, but here I am, excited about my last year of high school, planning for college, and reflecting on my personal growth and achievement. Finally, I'm happy, and I know that I deserve every bit of it. Support from my family and friends helped me open my eyes to a life worth living. While every day remi remains a battle, it is no longer a fight for my life, but instead a fight for the life I wish to make for myself. Thank you, Nashbid, Dr. Miller, Dr. Rogers, my mom, and everyone here today for making children's mental health a priority. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm Khan Animoto, but also known as Raina's mom. And as you might imagine, I am extremely proud of my daughter. She has done incredible deep reflection um, work that she's done to understand the drivers of the hopelessness and despair that overcame her um, and for all the hard work that she put in to build back her strength and resiliency over the last year and a half. Um, the road to recovery, as you all know, is never easy, but for a young person living through COVID-19, through quarantine and all the disruption that went with it, the road was that much steeper. And in my work uh, at the Center for Societal Benefit through healthcare at McKinsey, um, we know that people need tools to make the changes that we all want to see. So we're working to increase access to publicly available data with analytics and visualization tools um, now focused on children's mental health. Since we know our young people have struggled through this time, and I'm sure um, when Dr. Rogers uh, presents this data, you'll learn in great depth both the positive and the negative trends that have been observed. But one trend I just want to point out here is that while overall suicide rates did go down um, in the past year and a half, we've seen an alarming increase in the proportion of girls and young women seeking care in the ED for psychiatric emergencies. Um, well, initially in spring 2020, we saw pretty equitable reductions in access to ED for both boys and girls. By winter 2021, we saw an increase in visits by boys um, for suicide-related crises of about 4%. Uh, and the rate of suicide-related ED visits for girls was 50% above 2019 levels. So we're looking at a 12x uh, difference in um, increased rate between girls and boys. And so it stands to reason um, that, that we need to look at these gender inequities. It also means that we need to think about the parents. There's a concomitant increase in parental concerns. Um, or family, family and caregiver concerns. So in a recent survey of more than 15,000 caregivers in all 50 states, um, a McKinsey study that we did, 35%, so more than one in three parents said they were either very or extremely concerned about their child's mental health. So it's something with which I can relate very closely. So I look forward to uh, Dr. Rogers' presentation. Um, the work of NASHBID, 
uh, U.S. state leaders, uh, our incredible providers, our young people and their families can uh, and will be super impactful as we strive to promote resilience, prevent mental illness and substance use disorder, to increase access to community-based crisis care, as Dr. Pinnells so eloquently described, um, and to implement evidence-based treatment models with the same urgency, care, and compassion that we do for other serious health conditions. I never would have imagined in all my years in federal service and in advocating um, for better quality of care for all Americans that we would have had to have struggled so much in our own family to get access to adequate community-based crisis care and evidence-based treatment. Um, it, was, it, it took all we had as a family to get there, um, but I am super glad that we did. So on behalf of our family, I thank you guys for making this a topic of your meeting today and for the good work you will continue to do tomorrow. With that, I hand it over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Kana. Shall I go, David, or? Okay. All right, so I'd like to really thank Raina. I, I really appreciate your, your braver, bravery and willingness to really come out and share your story with us. I think it was really striking and I think really hit to the heart of where I think a lot of kids are, kids are struggling. Um, having been a child psychiatrist for the past, I hate to admit, 25 years or so, um, you see lots and lots of kids. But during this particular time, I think what's particularly striking is the level of struggle that I am, I am seeing from, from young people. So as we get started, I want to, first of all, in Brian's sense of things, in terms of gratefulness and thankfulness, I'd like to, first of all, thank Dr. Pinels for um, uh, being really a great editor on this paper, but also um, one that helped me kind of reformulate my thoughts and clarify them as I was writing. And I'd also like to thank Brian and the folks at, at Nashville for um, the great work that they are, that they are doing. Um, as we start to think about, you know, kids and mental health and COVID, I hate to use the term, but I'll use it anyway because I get sick of hearing it all the time, is unprecedented. And we're truly living in unprecedented times. Um, other terms that I've tried to avoid using are things like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Tele, anything. Um, but it's interesting, and I bring those things up because it really has changed the landscape of how not only we as adults and professionals think about things, but also how young people and, and kids begin to think about things during this time period. Because it has certainly changed the way that I think all of us look at the world, look at connectivity, and look at how we engage with, with each other. All right, next slide. So there are three things that I'm going to try to spend some time talking about today. Um, the first one is looking at COVID mental health and, and kids. Um, secondly, looking at some of the dis disproportionate things and the need for really thinking about cultural sensitivity, um, as Dr. Pinal has talked about um, earlier. And then thirdly, looking at poverty, financial equality, and how it's exacerbated mental health issue, issues. The thing that really has struck, that struck me over time, especially as I was listening to Raina and, and Kana talking today, was in the past, the inequality has been clear. Uh, but what's actually been very striking during COVID, um, and even kind of pre-COVID, are the number of middle class and upper middle class families that actually have insurance. Um, they have the ability to engage with therapists but are having difficulty actually getting in to seeing, see someone, which really gets to the lack of mental health services that are available in America, which extends beyond um, the inequality piece that we traditionally, traditionally think about, but has a lot to do with locale, um, especially in many rural, um, small towns, um, and especially in the Southern United States, where you begin to see a lack of child services, um, especially um, child psychiatrists. Next slide. So as we think about where we are in terms of depression related to COVID, this really is not a new thing. As you go back and look at studies in the past, especially around H1N1, Ebola, and even the flu epidemics, what we really see is an increase in depression and anxiety, both in adults 
um, and in kids. But what's striking about this particular pandemic is first of all, that it's, it's global. The second thing is the length of time that it's lasted. So if you go back to 2009 and 2010, when we were looking at swine flu, it lasted for approximately 13 and a half months. Um, whereas this particular disorder has really extended at, the, at this point, almost um, year and a half, um, will probably go into two years fairly, fairly soon. Um, and so the length of time that we're dealing with this increased level of stress, anxiety, and all the things that are going on is extremely problematic. The second thing is the fact that if you look at minority communities, they are 2.5, two to five times more likely to be hospitalized or die as a result of, of the disorder. Now that's important because not only of the, the effect that it's having on the young people themselves, but also the families that are around them as well, because we see this increased level of loss, um, of death, and things that we haven't traditionally thought about lots of young kids having to deal with. I was seeing a six-year-old recently who talked about having lost several family members and unfortunately having lost a friend um, recently. And so really having to kind of process through a level of loss earlier in life than we would have otherwise. And then we get into the whole idea of racism and inequality because we get into that intersection of the social justice movement. Um, we're seeing the outcries nationally in terms of protests that are occurring at the same time that we're seeing incidents occurring with, with COVID. And that really makes the perfect storm, especially for a lot of middle and high school students and really early college students who are now in this sense of really feeling very, very lost um, in terms of where am I, where am I going, and what does this all mean for me and me and my future? Now, until recently, we kind of thought of COVID as being a really adult disease. Um, it was one that kids really didn't have to think a lot. But however, we see a lot more happening now with the Delta that really is becoming more of a child-driven um, disorder, where now we're seeing a quarter of the cases, new cases, actually being among children and adolescents and the level of fear that that's creating. Uh, next slide. Now, I think of this slide as really being one that's very striking to me because it says a lot about where we are and what we're really struggling with um, with kids. So we see the steep, steep rise in cases, um, but also a fairly steep rise in hospitalizations. Deaths, we're seeing an increase, however, not so much so. However, if you look at the past month or so, even those trend lines may begin to change. Um, in South Carolina, for example, we have actually experienced four child deaths in the past couple of weeks, um, two actually in the same school district. Um, and so you're beginning to see our mental health services, especially in our schools, being extremely taxed. Um, our department covers 70% of the schools um, in the state of South Carolina. And what we're finding is that more and more kids and even more and more families are actually starting to seek our services in ways that we haven't um, in the past to the point where schools are actually asking us to increase our level of services, which is something that traditionally has not been done. It's usually us saying we're actually identifying more services. We would like to provide more services. Can we talk about it? The opposite is the beginning to happen now, which is a very, very different trend for us. Next slide. So as we think about the psychological challenges that are occurring, the first one that, that has jumped out at me is the increase in domestic violence. So our offices here at Department of Mental Health are immediately next door to our Department of Social Services, which is our social welfare agency in the state. So as we do our monthly staffings, they, it's become increasingly clear that domestic violence, especially driven by substance use issues, is becoming really a pandemic in and of itself. Um, but what's more concerning is 
the feeling that there's probably a lack of domestic violence events that are being reported because kids aren't necessarily engaging as much with schools and the kind of folks that would report those things um, in the past. The second thing is the level of family psychological distress. So as we look at families, um, parents losing jobs, children not being in school, prior existing mental health conditions, increased substance abuse, you can kind of see this perfect storm occurring where families are beginning to really have a great deal of difficulty that children are now having to process and not having the traditional outlet of school to be able to do that. And then thirdly, as Connell was talking about earlier, is the increased demand for mental health services. Um, I work in a large hospital emergency department um, doing primarily children's services. We're seeing an increased number of children coming into the emergency room with nonspecific complaints, results of domestic violence, results of family stress. Um, and so we see more crisis services occurring than we have at really any point in time in the past. But also in our local mental health centers, our children's numbers are actually beginning to rise substantially um, as well. And then of course, the increased parental distress for the same reasons that we see the family issues as well as the child mental health issues increasing. All right, next slide. The emotional challenges, I think, are also becoming extremely problematic. We see a negative impact on school readiness, um, primarily because children haven't been fully engaged in being prepared for school. Um, because if we think about some of the kindergartners, first graders who are now going into school, parents actually haven't been engaged and involved as much as they would have been in, past, in the past because of their own level of stressors that are occurring. Virtual learning um, has also increased the stress. I think about if we look at Zoom meetings um, and we look at as adults, how long can we stay focused on a screen? Um, how long do we really stay engaged in conversations? Most of us, if we're really honest with ourselves, find our attention going in and out at times. So think about that with an elementary or middle-aged kid that already has trouble focusing. And even the kids that may have some learning disability, may have ADHD, anxiety, or other problems that are going on at the same time. You begin to see this real interface uh, and challenge there in terms of engaging. We're seeing the increasing educational gaps that are occurring because kids going in school, out of school, virtual school, not virtual school. I was recently talking to a friend that had young children and over the course of the past 12 months, they've been in school for about a quarter of the time. They've been out of school for about half the time and they've been in hybrid models for the other quarter of the time. And so, Imagine going back and forth between trying to figure out how do I learn at a particular point in time. And this has really led to a loss of skills um, of about one to three months for Caucasian kids, but about a quarter to a half year for students of, of color. Additionally, making that problematic is the number of deaths, um, job losses, and family issues that have occurred. Um, recently, I was talking to a group of kids at one of the schools that, I, that I've covered in the past. And one of the things that really came up during a group discussion is almost all kids in this middle age group, middle school age group, could actually identify family members, friends, or others that they had lost during this COVID um, time period. And so there's a great deal of stress and difficulty occurring um, in schools. All right, next slide. Now, as we begin to look at the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, it has been relatively common in the past, but we're seeing really more data on what MIS-C um, really does cause in children because we're starting to see some of the long-term um, side effects um, and sequelae related to um, MIS-C. That's also true in adults as well. 
The other difficulty that we're seeing, even with kids that may be experiencing significant medical problems, are the disparities in access to, to health care um, and to being able to actually access the care that they, that they need. This is well documented in adults, but we're now starting to see it more in kids. Um, it's become increasingly striking. Um, recently, we were looking at the uh, ICE, number of ICU beds available in our hospital. Um, but it's not just ICU beds, it's actually beds related to mental health issues. It's beds related to general pediatric issues. For example, recently, we were looking at trying to get children in a public psychiatry bed in the state. And what we found is that because of COVID, um, we were actually having to go on quarantine for extended periods of time. And because of those quarantine periods, our census has dropped substantially. Therefore, we're admitting fewer kids to our hospital. That's actually true at a lot of the public hospitals in our area as well, as well as a lot of the general hospitals who don't have the bed capacity there on the inpatient side. On the community side, there's been periods where clinics have actually been shut down as well at a time when there's a need for increased physical health, somatic health, and mental health care as well. Many folks in the minority community especially are essential workers or have public facing jobs. They are also folks that tend to live in multi-generational homes. Um, so for example, as one of those folks that lives in a multi-generational home, we have an elderly mother-in-law who's in the family, but also kids, grandkids who are coming in and out of the home all the time, you can see the complexity that begins to be there in terms of risk and how do we begin to protect each other um, from all the things that are occurring. Next slide. Social isolation. Um, we know that social isolation continues to be a significant problem. One of the things that we know from numerous studies is when we have increased amounts of time alone, we also see increased levels of depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues that are there. Socialization actually improves most mental health disorders um, with the exception of very, 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 very few. And so as we begin to see the social isolation occurring, we begin to see an increase in those disorders. We also began to see worsening of kids with, with pre-COVID pre psychiatric disorders, especially PTSD, ADHD, and developmental disorders. Those kids also tend to be in situations where they're actually in congregate settings, such as groups and other treatment settings, where they're not able to do some of that stuff during COVID, which begins to also become extremely, extremely problematic. And that lack of peer interaction, especially around cognitive changes, cognitive disorders um, at a time where developmental changes are occurring and emotional difficulties, we begin to see that that peer interaction is also having a significant negative effect. And then finally, the use of technology. Technology can be a wonderful thing. However, it gets back to really that conversation we were having earlier is how is that technology used and where is it utilized? As we started looking across our schools here in South Carolina, what we found is that about a third of our schools were actually fairly rural without really significant, well, with significant broadband issues. Um, and where you had broadband available, it was sometimes very inconsistent. And so you begin to see this disparity that occurs between the rural, the suburban, and the more urban, urban kids. Also, that technology really depends on what kind of technology do you have available to us. Um, in many cases, it's a cell phone. In many cases with young kids, there may not have been any kind of technology available to them um, at all. And so how do we begin to think of ourselves getting past some of those barriers that have previously existed and how do we really begin to think of technology in the future? This has also been the case as we've, think of, as we've had to think about rolling out technology for a lot of our mental health business. Um, we have found that the ability to engage kids through technology has actually been more problematic 
than actually engaging some of our adults. Um, because kids, unless you have something that's moving, going on constantly, aren't able to engage in those conversations for extended periods of time in similar ways that you might find some of your late adolescents and adults engaging. Uh, next slide. We then move to an area where I think we have a lot of opportunity. And that really is in our areas of institutionalization. As we look across um, juvenile justice settings, for example, we see really these communal settings being at significant risk for outbreaks, um, which we've seen both in public mental health systems as well as juvenile, juvenile justice systems. And so you have this increased risk of putting kids in, in a small space. The difficulty you then run into is a lot of these kids being sent out into the community during COVID for reasons that were not as clear as they would have been in the past, but also at the same time, shuttering programs for periods of time that really cater to kids that were institutionalized. And so we begin to see at the same time where there's an increased need for mental health services, programs that are now being shuttered, and kids that are out now leaving some of those institutionalized settings, you begin to see this real storm brewing for what do we now do with care for these particular kids. And then limiting the population um, for which you know, care is, care is actually, actually available. Okay, next slide. So then we move to the issues of financial inequality, which we've talked about uh, previously, but also economic instability. What's become increasingly clear as we look at data across South Carolina especially is the level of economic instability that's occurring. And it's really one that we still have not fully understood, especially as a state agency. We have watched our workforce significantly decline. But when we're talking to a number of our employees about where you're going, many are actually choosing to stay home out of fear. And when you begin to have the conversation, what you begin to recognize is that they would actually rather go to the economic instability um, rather than actually being in the workforce itself. We've talked about technology barriers earlier. Um, and then we begin to think about our community mental health centers and the challenges that they're going to have um, as well. Next slide. And so in terms of our recommendations, um, we really have to think carefully about how do we creatively think about summers, um, especially this past, this past summer as I was writing this paper and thinking through things. Having summer school, summer camp, volunteer opportunities for kids became extremely important. The second one is really looking at our health systems. And if we really look at it, most of our systems may be the one health system that most of our kids are actually engaged um, with. Um, and then finally, really looking at how do we begin to advocate for full funding of social welfare programs and the social safety net that actually exists within, within the populations. And so I'm being told that I'm out of time there, but uh, thank you for this opportunity to um, really talk about kid services and beginning to look at how do we begin to think about systems of care um, for kids as we begin to begin to move forward. Dr. Rogers, thank you so much. And um, I just want also to echo um, to Kana, I know you had to see it in chat, uh, all the outreach of thank you so much for opening your family uh, to us for this issue. Uh, I, I know a lot of the responses were from members of the Children's Youth and Family Division. So I think today this is very dear to their heart. And I hope that you also relate to Raina, um, just what, what courage she has uh, to, to come on and talk to a bunch of strangers about something so personal. So thank you. Um, please, uh, if you have a question, pop it into the chat or you can unmute uh, yourself uh, and ask it directly. Uh, I do have a couple. Uh, so I'm going to start. 
One came to me directly, and it's to Dr. Rogers. And Connie, if you want to chime in on it, you go for it. Um, but it was, uh, and of course, the, uh, the, it moves on me. I have to go back up to it. Uh, Dr. Rogers, it seems like this is a mass traumatic event for kids. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to effectively address this broad-scale trauma from a population health perspective? I absolutely agree. That that's exactly what it is. When we think about you know type one and type two traumas, this is one of those ongoing traumas, and kids are constantly being really re-traumatized in lots of ways. Um, and I think there are several things that we have to think about. First of all, is we haven't had a really good public health strategy um, for thinking about how we deal with kids. And unfortunately, COVID has become so politicized that it's been difficult. So for example, here in South Carolina, we haven't been able to get our politicians to agree on mask mandates for elementary age kids. It would seem like a very easy thing to do, but we can't do that. Um, and so if we're having difficulty with something that seems relatively straightforward, trying to get to more of a public health discussion becomes even more difficult. Um, one of the things that we have worked with schools here locally is trying to figure out how can we build more school mental health resources so that even when kids are out of school, we're doing more preventive measures for those kids who aren't in school. Um, some of those things have been going back and looking at some of the apps that are available, especially for, for kids, um, beginning to help our teachers be able to do a better job with outreach um, for children who aren't displaying symptoms. And so looking more broadly and globally um, at all kids in general. But then also one of the things that um, I've personally been interested in and has actually been fairly effective here in South Carolina is actually working with community organizations, especially our faith community, um, to begin to engage children and families. Um, in South Carolina, where you have a lot of churches, the vast majority of the populations engaged in some form, trying to figure out how do we really engage that group has been extremely beneficial and I think has been actually our most effective outreach that we have had for really getting in our larger population of kids. Great. Colin, do you have anything to, to add on that? No? Okay. Um, so another question, um, uh, I'm going I'm to com combine them, uh, but uh, uh, beyond domestic violence, are you monitoring community violence? Uh, and do you have any recommendations or research on uh, restorative justice strategies among youth or at-risk at youth uh, experiencing justice involvement? Those are great questions. Um, community violence has been a really interesting thing to try to measure during the pandemic. And it's because the social justice movement occurred at the same time. During the social justice movement, what I began to see was a lot more kids that were involved. But I also began to see things that were identified as being illegal activity, which led to detention, arrest of some young people that in the past probably wouldn't have been. And so I think it's gotten into this really complex mix of politics, social justice, and an environment that really was right for all of those things happening, happening at the same time. I think the restorative justice movement has been one that's been extremely important. But I think that what's been more challenging, especially in our state, has been how do we see juvenile justice in general? So at the same time that we have looked at restorative justice, our juvenile justice budget was actually cut. Um, and so it became a situation where there's the things that we know work, like restorative justice, that we actually can't do because of some of the other forces that are occurring um, at the same time. And so it feels like we're in this kind of yin-yang pull and tug back and forth between what we think is good 
in some cases and what others see as bad um, in other situations. Great. Um, so uh, the chair of the uh, Children's Youth and Family Division um, asked if your thoughts about supporting families along with children and youth in these times, perhaps differently than what happens in the larger adult system. You know, I think it's been, we've struggled with how to think about supporting children. Um, and part of it has been, we haven't figured out how to do a good job of it, I think across the country. And part of it's because children have not been in a stable place. And that lack of instability for children, I think has led to a lack of instability for children's mental health. So most of our services for kids are provided in schools, but schools have been open part of the time and closed part of the time. And so we've had to think about really changing our services from kind of telephonic services to telehealth services to in-person services, and then kind of recycling at the same time. So right now, for example, we're finding ourselves going back to telehealth and telephonic services as more schools are actually closing. And so we haven't been able to develop a strategy because of the inconsistency of the world in which we're working. And so trying to figure out how you provide that support has not been, has not been easy. And I suspect it's probably been a difficulty around the country as well. I think you're right. Uh, and certainly I think it echoes, I, I see a lot of heads moving up and down. And I think I see a lot of kids directors uh, agreeing with you. Um, I know we are almost out of time. I wanted to see if, if, if Connie, if you had any last comments to make um, before we close out. I, I think the only comment I would make is that, um, you know, this is, there is tremendous tailwinds right now. Uh, behind behind us, you know, the, I think there's a an opportunity um, both with the the administration and and as Dr. Dolphin Ritman is committed to these issues, the the president is committed to these issues, the enforcement of the parity laws, you know, the the looking at network adequacy. I think we have, um, you know, it's a great time uh, to be in behavioral health. There's an incredible amount of uh, investment funding um, coming into the space. Um, but I would, I would also encourage us to be, you know, to continue to be as creative and innovative as we always have been before we've been creative and innovative because we didn't have enough resources. Now we have plenty of resources, but the, the precious resource we don't have is, is people. Um, and so I think looking at those models that, that help people practice at the top of their license, that we're advancing integration with primary care, um, and, and making the best use of all of our allied health and human service, uh, colleagues, I think is, is probably the only way that we're really gonna meet the needs of, of all the kids that, and families that, that are out there. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Rogers, any last comments before we uh, turn it back to Dr. Hepburn? You know, I love Kana's comment about really integrated care because I, I do think that that is the wave of the future um, because we have, to, we have to engage other folks um, that are outside of mental health because there's no way we're going to see a lot of the kids and provide the care that we have to on our own. And so I think engaging the larger medical community, but I think also engaging those other systems that exist to help teach them about mental health becomes critically important because a lot of those kids are gonna interface with, with people and may never come into our systems. And so trying to really strengthen kids' services in general becomes, I think, incredibly important. Thank you, Kana. Thank you, Raina. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Incredible 45 minutes. Um, Dr. Hepburn, back to you. Thank you, David. Very impressive. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Kana. Thank you, Raina. Um, gave us a lot to think about. 